This video is meant to introduce you to the bacterial infection sugar toxin producing E. coli. The symptoms of STEC vary from person to person, but often include severe stomach cramps, diarrhea, which can be bloody, and vomiting. If there is fever, it's not usually very high. Most people get better within five to seven days. Some infections are very mild, but others are severe or even life-threatening. The incubation period is one to 10 days with an average of three to four days. E. coli bacteria are very normal to find in, our, in the body and are part of our gut flora, but E. coli bacteria causes illness when they produce sugar toxins. They're named for Kiyoshi Shiga, who first described the bacterial origin of dysentery caused by Shigella dysenteriae. Infections caused by sugar toxin 1, sugar toxin 2, or both. Sugar toxin 2 is known to cause more severe infection and is most often associated with the development of hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. The toxins that are produced by STEC, sugar toxins, can enter the bloodstream and destroy red blood cells, which make it different and more severe than E. coli, the normal kind we carry in our guts that doesn't cause any illness. This bacteria is spread through the fecal oral route, meaning it's found in the stool of an infected person or animal and gets into the mouth of someone through a variety of modes. STEC bacteria are normally carried in the guts of ruminants, including cows, goats, sheep, deer, and elk and are passed to humans through raw and unpasteurized products like, like milk, cheese, or juice, contaminated fruits and vegetables, and undercooked meat products, particularly ground beef. It can be spread through swimming pools or lakes, and it can also be passed person to person. Therefore, when an animal poops near a field, it can get into our foods, like lettuce. Or when meat is ground and bacteria from the outside of the cow or its environment can contaminate the meat during slaughter and processing. And pe when people eat burgers that aren't fully cooked to temperature, the bacteria can survive and make us sick. Most cases of STEC are mild and resolve on their own without treatment. However, some become very ill and can even die. One of these complications is called HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. HUS is a severe life-threatening kidney disease that occurs when the red blood cells that are damaged by sugar toxins clog the kidneys and prohibit the blood's natural blood filtering system. HUS develops an average of seven days after onset of diarrhea when patients are typically starting to improve. Children, the elderly, and immunocompromised persons are the most likely to develop HUS following an E. coli infection. HUS is the most common cause of acute kidney failure in children, and E. coli is the most common cause of HUS among children. Individuals infected with HUS begin to lose color in their cheeks, become irritable, weak, have decreased urine output, and sometimes bruising and seizures. More than half of individuals who develop HUS have kidney damage that can lead to kidney failure requiring dialysis. About 10% develop chronic kidney failure. Other dangerous complications from HUS include high blood pressure, problems with blood clotting, heart problems, stroke, coma, and death. It's estimated that about 5 to 10% of STEC cases will develop HUS. Now I want to talk about some famous outbreaks of STEC. Two, big, two of the biggest vehicles for STEC outbreaks that people think of most often are ground beef and leafy greens. In the past years, there's been outbreaks of romaine lettuce, spinach, ground beef, frozen hamburger patties, tacos from Taco Bell with an unknown food vehicle, alfalfa sprouts, rotisserie chicken salad, chipotle with the unknown, with the vehicle being unknown, gouda cheese, in-shell hazelnuts, flour, cookie dough, frozen pizza, and soy nut butter. The next section will cover the common terms and lab tests that are used when looking for STEC. The really hard part about STEC as a category is that it's part of E. coli, which is a broader umbrella. So unlike Salmonella or Campylobacter, not all E. coli cases are the same and should be reported to public health. Public health only cares about the small subsection of E. coli that produces sugar toxin. A stool culture is when you grow up the bacteria and you can see the growth with your eye. A laboratorian will take a stool sample and smear it on a plate, which is like a petri dish with media, and media is a fancy word for a jelloey substance that makes bacteria happy and grow, and then put it in an incubator and wait for the bacteria to grow for a day or two. With cultures, you know that the bacteria is living, but the downside is that it takes a little bit of time to finalize a report, and doctors are not always fond of that. Another great thing about cultures is that you get isolates, which are pure growth of that organism. 
that you can do more testing on or send them to the state lab. An isolate is like that period between the E and C of E. coli. That little pure, pure circle is a colony of bacteria that can be scooped up and plated for more testing. But as technology advances, culture tests are becoming less common and they're being replaced with what are called culture independent diagnostic tests or CIDTs. The next, next two slides will discuss tests that fall under the CIDT umbrella. EIA or ELISA is looking for the antigen or antibodies. An antibody is something that your body makes in response to an antigen. In the case of STEC, the toxin is acting as an antigen. So these EIA tests are looking specifically for the STEC toxin. These tests tend to be quick, but depending on the type of EIA kit, it might need to have a culture done before, um, beforehand, which can slow down some of the results or have, it will have growth in what is known as a broth. Broth is a liquid media like liquid jello that the bacteria also like and will grow in. A common way that labs will report this test is to say STEC antigen or EIA or ELISA. PCR is a nucleic acid based test, which means this test is looking for DNA or RNA of the pathogen. These PCR tests are looking for the genes of the bacteria that make the toxin in the case of STEC. What's great about this type of test is that it's usually pretty fast. It can give you an answer in a few hours compared to a day or more, which can happen with cultures and sometimes EIA. Another quality that makes this a wave of the test, wave of the future for testing is that some PCR tests don't need an isolate. You can take your sample of poop, pop it in this magic box, and in a few hours you'll have an answer about what's in it. This is how GI panels like BioFire works. The downside is that you don't get an isolate. When you get an isolate from doing culture, you're getting a live organism. With PCR, you're only detecting the DNA or RNA, so it doesn't tell us if this is still a living organism. The cross-reactivity of this test is also something to consider. Let's go through a typical scenario. A person with diarrhea goes to the doctor and hopefully the doctor collects a stool sample. When the doctor orders a stool sample, they're casting a wide net looking for the most common reasons that somebody might have a GI illness. This means that the lab will set up plates or tests that look for a wide range of pathogens, including Salmonella, Campylobacter, Shigella, and STEC. Because STEC is special and reacts differently than just regular E. coli, a culture alone can't always tell us whether it makes a sugar toxin or not. That's why most labs will do a culture in EIA. If you see a lab that says stool culture with sugar toxin, and the culture is for Salmonella, Campylobacter, and sometimes Vibrio. The part we care about is the STEC, which is detected with a sugar toxin EIA. However, there are a few cultures out there that can be screening for 0157 and, and a special type of media, a more expensive and fancy jello, that can be a screening for 0157 E. coli because these media are not as common anymore and they're more expensive than what most labs tend to use. This wide net being cast also works for GI panels like BioFire where they put in the stool and the machine looks through all sorts of DNA until it finds something that matches what's in its database. These panels can sometimes tell the difference between 0157 and other sugar toxin producing E. coli, which can be very useful information during an outbreak. Like previously mentioned, EIAs can use isolates or broth, which is the stool mixed with the liquid media to do testing. If a lab uses an EIA, and they don't do any culturing, then they still need to send that sample, either the broth or the stool, to our state lab. Some labs might discard the positive EIA or PCR test without forwarding to the state lab because they don't do isolates anymore. However, all positive STEC samples must be sent to the state lab. It does not matter what type of test is used to get the positive when forwarding to the state lab, or if the sample was isolated or if it's in a broth, if a broth was used or preserved stool, we want that to be forwarded to the state health lab as well. Our state lab can do more testing to tease out the sugar toxin serotyping, which is good for public health. Once a specimen arrives at our state lab, if it comes in as a CIDT or a broth, it is cultured to, maintain, to obtain an isolate. Because the path pathogen can degrade if it's not shipped or stored properly, such as it's out of temperature, the lab's ability to isolate STEC from a CIDT or broth is not 100%.
However, if it comes in as an isolate or our lab is able to culture it, the isolate has DNA extracted and whole genome sequencing or WGS is completed. WGS has replaced PFGE for how we obtain genetic information, um, which is a unique DNA fingerprint. And this helps us detect clusters and outbreaks. So whole genome sequencing allows for us to know what serogroup of Aztec has been isolated, which is another indicator that we might have matches. Now our state lab can identify 0157, which is the most common serogroup in the United States. 0157 is known to be more severe than other STEC serogroups. E. coli 0157 is associated most commonly with HUS. Uh, however, HUS can be caused with other serotypes. Our lab can also identify the next most six common serogroups called the big six. All other serogroups of STEC besides 0157 and the big six have to be sent to CDC for typing. Now I want to talk about the case definition for STEC, which can help you determine whether the lab results you're reading indicate a real case of STEC, how to classify it, and whether it's confirmed, probable, or suspect. Step one of figuring out whether you have a case of STEC is to make sure that you're saying the right words. So all of these words listed, or any combination of them, will tell you that this is a case of STEC and that you do want to investigate it. However, E. coli is very, very confusing sometimes, and a slight rearrangement of letters can lead you to believe that you have a case when you actually don't. Regular E. coli are bacteria found in the environment, foods, and intestines of people and animals. E. coli are large and diverse, and most strains are harmless, while others can make you sick. So the difference between regular E. coli and the E. coli that we investigate is that shigatoxin. So none of those listed are going to be reportable. If you see these, these are considered not a case. Next, I'll talk about some pointers for investigating cases of STEC. Please, please do not wait for STEC cases to be interviewed waiting for medical records. We hope that you'll investigate these with a sense of urgency and prioritize them. And as usual, the ADHS interview team is always available to help. In past years, we used to say the state lab results trumped any other positive lab result, meaning that if a specimen was positive at a clinical lab, but negative at our state lab, it will be ruled out as not a case. However, this has changed. We now want you to classify your cases based on any positive lab result, even if the specimen was negative at our state lab. When you're investigating cases of STEC, the investigation form is pretty straightforward. There's a standard form in the DSO that will cover all the heavy hitters known to cause cases and outbreaks of STEC. Remember when you're interviewing cases, we want you to focus the vast majority of your time on exposures. Onset dates are really critical, but we hope you won't spend much time on getting a symptom history. We want to know whether or not they had diarrhea, but most of the symptom detail doesn't change the course of our investigation. We know that the majority of outbreaks of STEC have been caused by leafy greens and ground beef. So most likely, when we're interviewing cases, we want to get a lot of detail about these items. Make sure you're asking about how the ground beef was packaged, the percent fat and lean, whether it was fresh or frozen, whether or not it was preformed patties, and how it was prepared. For leafy greens, it's great to get brand names, variety, and packaging information. But we also see quite a few outbreaks with unexpected vehicles. All of these food items are unexpected vehicles, which underscores how important it is to listen, ask probing questions, and allow space for your interview for people to talk about um, other exposures that may be off the beaten path. And it's really easy for us to become sort of jaded with our interviews and for these to become mundane when we're, when we're, when we're in a routine and just trying to get things done. But I encourage you to tune in during these conversations and treat every interview as if it's part of an outbreak. It's easiest to get the most detailed information the first time you speak with someone when their memories are most fresh. And when asking questions on the questionnaire, remember to ask follow-up questions about when and where it was purchased and consumed, how it was packaged, the brand name or label color, and how it was prepared. Also, when you talk to cases about exposures that are not on your questionnaire, this can be an important time to gather information about their activities, lifestyle, and this can provide you a chance to answer follow-up questions. This is a critical field in medicine that must be filled out with yes or no. Please do not select unknown or leave this field blank when asking about hemolytic uremic syndrome for your case. And peanut butter and jelly is my favorite pair that just belong together. So I hope you'll remember that cases of 
HUS can't exist alone. There must be a case of STEC associated with all cases of HUS. You just can't have one without the other. This is the case even if the person was diagnosed with HUS and they were not tested for STEC or they were tested and that result was negative. Every HUS case needs a case of STEC. Because STEC can be passed person to person, it's a disease that requires exclusion if the case is symptomatic or if there's a symptomatic contact who works or volunteers in food handling, childcare, or a medical setting providing direct patient contact. And as far as returning to work, as of July to, uh, January 2018, non-culture tests like PCR and EIA can be used to allow a case to return to work. Cases of STEC who fall into the categories of healthcare, childcare, or food handling will need to be excluded until their diarrhea has stopped until they provide two negative stool samples, or until the health department has determined that they're unlikely to infect others. This wraps up our introduction into shiga toxin producing E. coli, or STEC, but know that the food team is always available to assist if you have any questions. <laughs>